With the passing of time, things forgotten or neglected come back into focus. And I think this is especially the case in the example set in the field of learning by Francis Bacon. Sir Francis Bacon, Lord Verulam, Viscount St. Alban, High Chancellor of England, was one of the universal geniuses of all times. I suppose that he could be listed in the same classification as Leonardo da Vinci, who took all knowledge as his province. Bacon's position in learning is unique, for in his personality and in his skills, he made possible within his own nature to achieve a unification of knowledge, which is very seldom to be found in any one personality. Bacon's areas of skills included, first of all, the legal profession. In this, he went to the highest possible office, next only to the king in power. As high chancellor and as legislator, he was the outstanding genius of his time. Scarcely less important were his advancements in learning. He was probably the father of modern science, and his entire approach toward knowledge was highly scientific. He recognized the fallacies in the academic traditions of his time and laid the foundation for what we call the inductive system of reasoning. Under inductive reasoning, science rose from a pitiful background to one of the most powerful positions in the world today. Scarcely less important were his contributions in philosophy. He was a philosopher of great parts, a person whose intellectual skills enabled him to integrate most of the great philosophical systems that had preceded him. He was not only a powerful Western thinker, but in a large number of his specialized philosophical researches, he seems to have instinctively fallen into a considerable part of Buddhist philosophy, although he probably did not know it. Next in importance, of course, was his literary output. He was a writer of extraordinary genius. His essays, written when he was a young man, are still considered to be one of the perfect examples of English literature. He had an immense vocabulary and a wonderful power of turning a well meditated and well-considered thoughts. In his field of literature, he was a poet. He also transcribed and poetized a number of the Psalms of David. It is believed, on pretty fair foundation, that he was also the final editor of the King James Version of the Bible. In addition to these numerous and highly diversified accomplishments on the intellectual and material levels, he was a devoutly religious man. His prayers, the attorney's prayer, the student's prayer, are simple, humble, and magnificent expressions of an indwelling expression of the presence of the divine in his own daily life. His uh, secretary and chaplain, Dr. Raleigh, said of him, if ever the light of God descended upon any man in this century, it was upon his lordship. For although he was a great reader of books, his knowledge came not from books, but from some deep hidden source within himself. Now we kind of think of this as an extraordinary combination. But this combination should, unfortunately, not be overlooked in estimating his attainments. He was probably one of the best qualified persons to approach the problems of daily life. As a scientist, he had these basic abilities, skills, and procedures. As a scientist, he created the modern scientific method. At the same time that he was a scientist, he was, as he says, a humble child of God, 
hoping always to be obedient to the divine will. We do not produce many geniuses today that have such a span. We find specialists, and against these Bacon himself rose in indignation. He felt convinced that no individual could advance far in any area of knowledge unless he was dedicated, trained, and had within himself an imperishable desire to be of use and service to mankind. All of these make his writings and his philosophy very important. A very brilliant English writer said, quote me a sentence from any of his books and I will tell you who wrote it. This was the peculiar uniqueness of his ability. The principal writings of Bacon that have descended to us, he never completed his great concept, but his most important writings are the Novum Organum, the New Organ, of the mind, and the Augmenta Scientiorum, the advancement of learning. In his spare time, he apparently produced some shorter works, and our subject this morning deals with one of these light or slight procedures or productions of his lordship's meditation, the wisdom of the ancients. This little book, which has only less than a hundred pages, is not a really a work in itself. It is a combination or a culling from his more important writings of analogies and allegories which he regarded as archetypal. Bacon's Wisdom of the Ancients would be a, is of great interest to modern dream analysts, those studying symbols, those concerned with meditations, those seeking to transcend the commonplace in the investigation of nature. Bacon was not uh, addicted primarily to ancient learning. He doubted many parts of it. But he realized something which perhaps someday we must all discover, namely that ancient learning is archetypal. He did not use the term. It was not in use in his day. But it arose from something that was not... Uh, a conscious process of thinking. Mythology, to him, was a kind of dreaming, the dreaming of the world before the rise of organized knowledge. Mythology is not only the history of prehistoric times, it is a statement of prehistoric thought, of those patterns which are innate in the individual, those archetypal concepts which, though they appear in a thousand forms, are still always based upon some remote subjective experience. Uh, Bacon, I think, would have assumed that these ancient fables relate in a concealed way the experience of prehistory. Those who lived long ago, whose bodies have long been in the earth, but whose strange and wonderful mental concepts, redressed in every age, have come down to us with tremendous moral force. Most of these fables are simply extracts from his other works, but they indicate the thoughtfulness of the uh, mind that conceived and developed them. According to Bacon, this world is not a series of accidents. It is not a production of blind forces. It is not governed by laws of physical matter alone. This world as we know it is a living thing, a tremendous composite. This living thing is ruled over by processes, by principles, and by laws. These laws, processes, and principles as he tells us in the Wisdom of the Ancients, were personified, clothed, given embodiment in mythology. Mythology, therefore, is a secret language. It is a language which, very much like the names bestowed upon the pieces in a chess game, they represent always principles. The deities were not arbitrary despots on some Olympian peak. 
they were the personification of the impulses, the convictions, the ideals, the experiences, the intuitions of mankind from the earliest known time. So considered, we find, I think, that Bacon justifies very much of antiquity. We look back upon the golden age of Pericles in Greece, and Bacon's fables all have a Grecian background, and we realize that in those days the world produced some of its most important and powerful minds. Pythagoras, who gave us essentially ancient science. Plato, the philosopher of his age and of his time. Orpheus, the great inspirer of religion among the Greeks. These persons and hundreds of others, Euclid, Demosthenes, Antisthenes, all the great minds of that time certainly did not believe uh, that the gods were a group of despots sitting on the top of Mount Olympus. The bullfinch fables that have come down to us are simply the outer cover just as in every religion we find parables, allegories, fables uh, to press home upon us certain truths that might otherwise not be easily recognized. Those today who are concerned with archetypal subjects who are also wish to test the depths of their own intuitions would profit considerably by the study of Bacon's little volume on the wisdom of the ancients. I should point out, however, that it was written by a lawyer, by an individual whose career physically was very greatly involved in statesmanship. He was the counselor of kings. He was one of the most powerful men in the realm. And much of his interpretation naturally impels him towards the application of principles to the office which he himself held. On the other hand, there are some of these fables that have obviously nothing to do with politics or legislation or legality, but have to do with morality and ethics. And all of them, of course, deeply tinged by Bacon's conviction that a divine power was the source and guide of all existence. So we'll take a few odds and ends from among these fables, and probably most of you have read the children's versions of the Greek mythology. Therefore, you will be uh, able to follow uh, at least the general outline, and perhaps might, you might be inspired to give mythology a second look because of the very interesting things that are contained therein. Bacon mentions carefully that he only selected certain fables. He said that some were too obvious to require analysis. Others had to do with matters beyond the average public ken. But he had chosen those which seemed to him to prove conclusively uh, that this wisdom did exist, and that it is a wisdom which, sad to say, we are in great need of today. So we'll start with one very simple uh, example. Uh, the uh, principal deity of the Greek pantheon was Zeus. And Zeus was the representative of the deities and was the ruler of the mundane creation. He was not the supreme deity, but he was the ruler of the world in its manifestation. He was the god-king of existence. And according to the story, it is said that in one of Babel, that Zeus courted Metis. And from Metis, and the, uh, the union of Metis and Zeus, was born Pallas Athena, from the head of Zeus, armed and helmed. Now Bacon points out that he doubts very much if Socrates believed that, in its outer form. He is quite sure that Plato could not have. He was quite sure that the archons of Athens did not. Therefore, why did they participate in this believing and also uh, follow and preserve these fables? Bacon does not point out, but I think it might be interesting to add at this time, 
that the reason why they accepted this was because they had been initiated into the state mysteries and they knew the key. The rest of the world worshiped the face and surface of things as we do today. But to those who penetrated into the depths of things, the commonplace becomes itself, as Bacon says, so miraculous that no other miracle is necessary. So out of this little line of Jupiter, Metis, and Pallas Athena, he develops a quite an interesting uh, pattern. The word Metis means counsel. Therefore, we may say that power, Zeus, took counsel to wife, and from the union of power and counsel was born wisdom. Now we have to go a little further, though, to understand what was meant by this. Today our word wisdom has very little technical significance. Pythagoras probably gave it a greater significance. Like virtue, it is a very abstract term. The Greeks reserved the term wisdom not to a person who had knowledge or had learning or any of these things at all. Wisdom was the immediate participation and experience of truth. All men sought truth. Only those who found it had it. And only those who had had the mystical experience of identification with truth could be termed wise. This is a very much higher approach to the subject than we have today. In other words, wisdom was a theurgic union with reality. It had nothing to do with intellectual achievement. In the case of the sophists of Greece, it gradually fell into the interpretation of being professional educators. But even the sixth century before Christ, Pythagoras refused to be, a, to be considered wise, saying that only God is wise. And therefore he chose not to be a sophist, but a philosophist, and gave us the word philosopher, meaning a friend of or a lover of wisdom. He uh, never would accept the term of being wise. Now, in the case of Athena also, we have other interesting uh, considerations. Metis, being counsel, gave Lord Bacon, that's the meaning of the word, gave Lord Bacon a concept of the importance of counsel in all procedures. That power must be governed by counsel. And out of counsel and power comes prudence. And out of prudence comes justice. All these things fit together in a series of concatenated orderly procedures, finally ending in the production of Pallas Athena. Now, Pallas Athena herself is a remarkable figure. And first of all, she was the only virgin in Olympus. She never married, she had no love affairs, she lived entirely alone, indicating in itself that wisdom was not involved in any of the secondary procedures of life. Wisdom was complete and eternal in its own nature. It had no affiliation to anything. It was remote and unapproachable, except through the inner experience of the individual. It never compromised. And the suitors of uh, Penelope were the compromisers that attempted to dilute truth. But she never would compromise. She never in any way uh, allowed the absoluteness of her integrity to be damaged. Therefore, she became the patron deity of the city of Athens and has descended to us as that form of integrity which cannot be corrupted. Now this integrity is in the individual, or it is in the world, or it is in the divine plan of things. Therefore we consider, as Bacon does, that Athena represents the inevitable victory of wisdom. Wisdom superior to all compromise, all 
reformation, all change. And to Bacon, this supreme wisdom was eternally and forever the same. Wisdom does not grow. It is born full-grown. Wisdom is not defenseless. It bears a shield and a spear. Wisdom is not obvious, for Pallas wore the helmet, and when she closed the helmet she became invisible. These different ideas can be thought about for a long time to test the allegories and the significance of these matters. But Bacon summarized the concept of that true wisdom which we are all seeking as being located in incorruptible virtue, which on the level of government means incorruptible integrity. And wisdom itself defends itself against every assault. No one can ever accidentally achieve it. No one can ever force the gates of wisdom. No one can take over this eternal quality. Now, wisdom of its own nature, being a principle incorruptible, the relationship of knowledge and learning to wisdom, this relationship becomes important. Knowledge and learning and all these are expressions of the ascent of human intelligence rising along the steps of what Bacon calls his pyramid of Pan. Knowledge is like the rung of a ladder above which men climb. It is also a road with many paths, as in the table of Cebes, in which persons of every walk of life, every degree of intelligence, every type of conviction, are groping along, always in search of that which is better. They are constantly striving toward wisdom. Their strivings are forever changing. And Bacon, being somewhat of a scientist, liked to point out that the strivings of science are forever changing. One day we have one belief, one day we have another. One scientist supports another, a third contradicts them both. Yet each one, in a way, is dedicated to truth. But to each one, truth is only what he is capable of experiencing. Therefore, Bacon points out that the greatest handicap to the advancement of learning is the human mind. Now here he comes very close to Buddha. He points out that as long as the individual is in captivity to the tyranny of mind, mind will hold him to the conditions with which he is familiar. The biologist will continue to grope along the lines of biology, the physicist along the lines of physics. The astronomer will continue to build larger lenses with which to view the heavens. But all these are not going to end directly in wisdom. Man will discover wisdom by the experience of his own errors. Little by little, he will come to discard that which is not true. It takes a long time. But one by one, his errors defeat him. One by one, his mistakes confuse him. One by one, his false believings fail him in emergency. Until finally he is stripped of everything that he thought would be able to support him. He is stripped of all his material assets. He is stripped of his concepts of government. He is stripped of everything that he has believed to be adequate. Not because he is told to turn from them, but because they have failed him. And so finally he comes into the gradual realization of the universal plan that underlies everything. And finally, if he reaches the apex of all his seeking, he will come to that mysterious inscrutability that power which alone is capable of causing all things and maintaining all things. For the search for knowledge ends in the achievement of the consciousness of the divine. Uh, This uh, has a message 
even for us in our modern world. A message that we need every day because we are still groping. And in this particular crisis, we are groping as never before. We are experimenting with things that we trust and believe. We are following the dictates of traditions which are insecure, but we have not uh, conditioned and regenerated our own inner lives. Therefore, we are incapable of being wise. And uh, wisdom is not merely the piling up of knowledge. Wisdom is the sorting out of error. And it's only in this way that we can gain the end we seek. Now, another one of the fables that Bacon makes a great point of is the story of Pan. Pan was a nature deity of the very ancient Greeks. He was represented as a creature, the upper part of his body being human, and the lower part the body of a goat. He had horns, and he had a bushy, a bushy body, and he had uh, a pan-like or animal-like face, face of a ram. He also carried with him, wherever he went, a flute or a kind of pipes consisting of seven tubes on which he played the music of nature. Bacon explaining the mystery of Pan tells us several interesting things. He says Pan is nature. Pan is that part of the world which we can see. Pan is an immense creature extending through many worlds. The lower part of the being is animal, the upper part is human. It is another form of the centaur. It represents the natural diffusion of things, the flowers, the meadows, the ancient ways, the trees, the birds. And uh, the pipes of Pan represent, in a sense, the melody and harmony of natural law. Bacon was convinced that natural law is the highest form of legislation, that there is no law man can create that equals its importance. Also, that no individual, no matter how wise, no matter how skilled, no matter how scientifically trained, can break a law of nature and survive. Therefore, he points out that man, instead of trying to protect himself against nature or exploit it, should have learned to understand it and obey it and love it because it is the hope of his own survival. Bacon was very definite in his realization that man is constantly exploiting and perverting the natural resources of life around him. He regards himself as born to manage, to govern, to administer the world. And Bacon is not so certain, but that this might potentially be true. But he definitely points out that the human being is approaching the matter in the wrong way. That this nature God is not, is not to be denied. That Pan, although we don't see anything that looks like him uh, in the world, is a very real being. Not because it's an image, not because it's a uh, creature that might have been extinct long ago, or a mythological animal like the dragon that may or may not ever have existed, but because Pan is a being. Nature is a being. Nature is not simply earth and dirt. Nature is not simply stars and comets. Nature is a being having within itself one of the most priceless powers that man can possibly understand, natural intelligence. Therefore, the natural intelligence of man made him superintendent over the natural intelligence of his world. But man has departed from this. He has substituted sophistication for natural intelligence. And in so doing, he has brought about a conflict between personal desire and natural law. 
Now, the tendency will be always to assume that man will ultimately attain a victory over nature. But according to the Baconian interpretation of the idea, the only victory that man can ever attain over nature is to form a constructive partnership with it. He can never change one of its rules. He can never justify a fault of his own that is contrary to natural good. He can never destroy the harmony of nature without destroying himself. And the harmony of nature are the, is the pipes of Pan. And he uh, hides in the reeds for the river and plays his pipes. And in the playing of these pipes he produces the melody of life. And the melody of life is in color, in form, and number. It is the perfect coordination of all of the beauties and processes of nature. And all of nature's processes, whether we understand them or not, are intrinsically beautiful. But man, arming himself against nature, has caused those things in which he disagrees with nature to appear wrong. It is the perspective, it is the point of view, it is the individual's own wrong relationship with life that produces the conflicts which we see around us every day. Now, in the ancient times, peoples were close to nature. They lived very much according to the seasons. They planted and they reaped according to the seasons. Animals obeyed natural law. Natural law guided the motion of the insect. It guided everything. And incidentally, it also dominated and ruled everything. So that where man has not interfered with nature, nature has seldom worked a hardship on him. But nature it, it demands the fact that while man's higher life rises above the empire of Pan, for his inner life is not part of material nature, his outer life is part of material nature. His outer life is part of the body of the goat. His inner life is the human head that rises from it. Therefore, uh, to paraphrase a biblical concept, it is the duty of every human being to render unto Caesar, that is nature, the things that belong to Caesar, and unto God, the higher nature, those things that belong to God. Now, Pan was never in conflict with God, essentially. They had a few misunderstandings, but they were ironed out in the course of time. The real problem was that Pan demanded the right to fulfill the destiny for which he was created. And it is also made note in one of the fables, as Bacon points out, that Pan had no had children, no successor. He was alone. Nothing followed him. He gave birth to nothing because he already was the full, complete structure of the natural world. So in the course of time, men began to improve on nature. They began to create various ways of exploiting nature. Now, while these ways were natural and were not affected by dishonorable means, Nature was abundant, but a man developed a peculiar ability to commercialize nature. He changed the bounty of God into things to be bought and sold. He put fences around little squares on the body of Pan, and as these fences began to come higher, the, as Solon points out, uh, the mortgage stones appeared on the land when men had to borrow money to pay their bills until finally the land was so covered with mortgage stones that you could no longer plant in it. Also, in the same general type of uh, human mistake, uh, the individual began to fight for other people's little piece of that land. And the harmony of nature was destroyed by the stupidity of human beings. Now, Pan was unhappy about all this. So Pan simply enforced his rules. He did not have to make any aggressive uh, 
judgment in the matter. He did not go out and pick anybody to punish. He simply pointed out in his own experience, as man themselves learned, that there were ways of doing things that were right. And that finally, learning, as we call it in the material world, was the ability to come to understand natural law. That the individual was learned who not only knew the law, but knew enough to keep it. All other forms of learning which are intended to escape or violate law are shemira. They are monstrosities, demons born out of illegal matings. So Pan went along very well through classical times, and gradually there rose the first great conquering power, Rome. And Rome was the first great colonizer. Rome was the power that took knowledge to gain authority. It trained its statesmen as conquerors. It trained uh, the Roman to put Rome first. And before the situation was over, they even trained them to worship the Caesars as divine beings. Gradually, an expansion and exploitation program started. Man departed from the ways of life. And it is said that the last oracle of Delphi, where they all went to seek guidance, the, law, the last cry of the oracle was, Great Pan is dead. The reason for this oracle was that man had, had exiled the God of nature, had cast him out, had gained the concept or conviction in his own uh, self-righteousness that he was the one who was going to rule the world. And although he outlawed these other powers, he really had not the power to change one single truth of life. In more recent times, we have had a rise in atheism in the world, in which it is no longer cried out that great Pan is dead, but it is even affirmed that, great, that God never existed. But it makes no difference whatsoever in the great pageantry of life. The, the principles that they can recognize were first primary causes, and these causes never change. Those who live along can build cities, build empires, but they must always build according to the law, or that which they build will crumble, no matter how powerful they may become. Nature, though less heard, less listened to, is still supreme. And among the uh, arts and sciences that were heavily influenced of this, of course, was, was medicine. And it was believed that Pan uh, gave to the Asclepiads all the medicines of life in the flowers of the field. That man had given to him every cure necessary for his own illness. Whatever happened, nature had a remedy. But men, in their haste, overlooked this and began finding artificial ways. Instead of following natural law, they used medications to cover their disobediences. And nature went right on being what it always was. Nothing changes. The changelessness of the eternal. All superficial things change continuously. Every generation has its own rules. Every civilization has its own cultures. Every nation has its own heroes. But nature never changes. And that which governed the first man will govern the last. It is not that we are weak when we give up the struggle against nature. It merely means that we are beginning to have a, an inkling of what wisdom really is. So this is, I think, a very interesting and informative fable. It gives us a great many interesting and, in, and invaluable things to think about.
Another fable that, gave, that Bacon gave close attention to was the story of Prometheus. And Prometheus, he says, signifies providence. Now, of course, you know that this, in the story of Prometheus, he is said to have assisted in the formation of the human being and finding him incomplete, took a bundle of reeds and raised himself to heaven and touched the chariot of Apollo. And where he touched the chariot, the reeds burst into flame. And Prometheus came back and brought fire to man. This is, of course, a very interesting fable, but it goes on beyond this point. Uh, Prometheus was, in a sense, uh, the individual who was against the establishment. Prometheus